you can do that sort of stuff and you go to a country that is, that, that is hostile to the gospel uh, as he has done, as he told the deacons yesterday, he's been robbed three times in a foreign country and he left without a dime. Well, I'd have probably had a heart attack and died. You know, what are we going to do? He's courageous. And so he has believed for a while that God wanted him more planted in ministry. And, and uh, oh, we're live. Okay, good. Okay, thank you, Paul. Well, we welcome you. And so I'm not going to tell you to keep that a secret because you're going to hear more about it. But do pray as the Lord moves forward. Um, I've got on the screen seven dispensations. I hope if you've got a Bible map that you can look at it. We're going to I'm going to put that picture on the screen in a moment. But I want to talk a little bit about these periods of time. And that's the, that's the confusion. You've got several camps uh, in, in, in the church circles. You've got, you've got the Calvinist camp. Uh, they, they have a little, little different view on, on the salvation question. And uh, the, the way we identify mostly with that camp is that uh, they believe that you're predestined either for heaven or hell and that you really don't have a choice. And uh, I've known some who have believed it so fervently that they wouldn't even, they didn't even want their kids to hear the plan of salvation. Uh, they were that, that convicted. I did a revival meeting at a, at a Christian day school up in Hendersonville. And um, the uh, brother Kent, we need some over here on this side too. And uh, there was a family, and they were Scandinavian in, in their um, country of origin, and uh, was in Hendersonville, and, and, and uh, were involved in, in, in a number of, of community things. Uh, a, a family name that everybody identified with, that knew him because of his business affiliations and. I didn't know who the kids were, but looked out, and here's a teenage young girl, probably 16, uh, with the blonde hair, the blue eyes, that whole kind of Scandinavian look. And then on the other a row or two, there was uh, uh, one other young man, and he was, I think, maybe a year younger. And you got that same profile, and then a third child. But I noticed, one, and, and, and the school bussed the kids over to Calvary Baptist. It was at the church. And so I was in the auditorium, and I was using an overhead. Back then, we didn't have computers and screens, so I had a transparency that, that really illustrated the plan of salvation and showed a man on the road of life, and you come to the cross. And then you got two roads. You got one from the point of the cross, one is going, and then there's this big abyss with fire at the end of it. And then you got the narrow road, that leads by the way of the cross, and that's the road to heaven. And the whole point is that you're on the road of life. You've got a choice to make. You can choose to receive Christ as your Savior. To do that, you've got to go by the way of the cross. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. There's no salvation. You take away the death of Christ. If you take away the, 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 the death of Christ, then in doing so, there's, there's just, salvation's just a debate on paper. It's not, you know, it's not a reality. And so that first service, I introduced that picture, put it on the screen, talked about it, emphasized to the young people. I said, now you're on, you're on a road. And that road's going to do one or two things. Either it'll lead you to heaven or the alternative, no option, but there's an alternative. And then I pointed out that we're born with a sin nature. So if we do nothing about the cross, then we're going to end up in that abyss, the lake of fire, because we have to choose Christ. And they went home and told their dad. He had a fit. He called school, called the principal, went down, and it was kind of, how dare you subject my children to this? And maybe apparently he'd already told them how he believed. But the point of it was, they didn't come back. And uh, when uh, I noticed on Tuesday, I missed them. Because I really felt like they were under conviction when I was talking to them. 
uh, or when they, they were on the edge of their seat listening. I'll say it that way. And some of the other kids were yawning. And so it was a bit overwhelming that they, they were that interested. Okay, we'll wait till we get this. <laughs> well, listen, it happens to the best of us. And you're in the class where it happens. I just set another record over here. I kept it in, in, intact. If I'm eating spaghetti, I'm going to get it on me somewhere. And I looked down, and I dropped some on my khaki pants. Now, had it been a darker color, it wouldn't have been. I looked down and said, well, my record's intact. I'm 100%. And so th things can happen when, when we least expect it. But anyway, let's go back to here. So the, 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 I'm, I just want to make the point that people get locked in to what they believe. And literally, we can make a God out of our theology. We worship our theology to the point that, I mean, if you, if you would stand in the way of your child hearing a clear presentation of the gospel, I mean, that, for me, it's unexplainable because truth is truth. Truth will never hurt you. You invite Christ into your heart. If you're sincere, you're saved. If you're saved, you've got to change your life. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And it's not a one-time new. It's not like I, said, I got saved 40 years ago. No. I experienced my salvation when I woke up this morning. Today's a new day. And because of my salvation, I get to spend the day with Jesus. If all I got's religion, it's holla. And it depends on my circumstances. If I'm having a bad day, I'm by myself. If I'm having a bad day as a believer, I got somebody helping me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And, and so when we look at doctrine, there, there are some people, when you say one word, they turn you off. Or in the case of this family, just the fact that their kids heard the plan of salvation and saw it illustrated, they slammed the door. Uh, you, you, you've got, whoa, you got among Baptists this one saved, always saved position without any real understanding of what you just said because they grew up hearing well if you're saved you, you know you're saved forever and, and, and but problem is church membership or baptism or observing communion or going to church won't save you as dr b.r lakin i heard him preach once for his death great evangelist uh, he said this, he said, you can be baptized until the frogs know your social security number. But he said, that won't get you into heaven. He said, sleeping in a garage won't make you a car. And going to church won't make you a Christian. It's a good place to be, but it won't make you a Christian. You've got to have that personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that changes your life. And so I, I don't doubt people who get real confusion over the salvation question if they get locked into a statement. And, and some people I've witnessed to, and, and yeah, well, do you know if you die, you're going to heaven? Well, I hope so. I said, but you can know. And I say, you received Christ as your Savior. They say, yeah. And then they'll say, well, I'm okay because once saved, always saved. And, and people hear that. If you're born again, if you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, if, as in you say in Hebrews chapter 6, within your heart, that longing for heaven and, and, and to be with him is there. Yeah, you had a life-changing experience. That, that's salvation. But salvation just is a loose word. Can get get us in trouble, but let's 
Let's go to work here. As we look at dispensations, it simply means a period of time. If you look at this in the context of school, and I don't know how many periods they have in school today, but if, if you think of this in seven class periods, I can remember my junior year because I got in trouble. I loved to chew chewing gum. And my football coach taught the American history class. And on the school bus that I drove, the kids would bring me candy and chewing gum. And I was chewing chewing gum. The third day, coach caught me three days in a row because I think he's looking. And he said, Young, you chewing chewing gum? And I couldn't swallow it quick enough. And so I said, Yes, sir. He said, Well, meet me down at the locker room after lunch. And so I go down. No, no, I know what it was. Before the class, he said this. Here's how dumb a 16-year-old is. Before the class, he said, all right, it's third time. He said, you can write, I must not chew chewing gum in American history class 300 times or meet me down in the locker room and get three licks. I said, I'll take three licks. Mm -hmm. One of my buddies was my size, but he had a brand new pair of blue jeans. He said, why don't you put on my blue jeans? They're thicker than the khaki pants I had on. I said, no, I'm all right. <laughs> yeah. He had me get the back cone on the foot locker, and he took his paddle about that long, and he just sort of tapped me a little bit. He didn't hit, just, just tapping, tapping, tapping. And then he took that paddle back, and when he come forward, he picked my feet up off the floor. And then he stopped. And he started patting again and the fire department had already rung a three alarm and I'm sitting there and then he hit me the second lick and then he stopped and he started patting again and he said how you doing big boy and I'm thinking if you don't hurry up that's the longest paddling I ever had and then he brought that third lick now my pride I don't know how I did it, but I left that footlocker and never stood up. Nobody ever saw those tears in my eyes that he had brought with that third lick and run and stuck my head in the, in, in the water fountain until I could really get my composure. But I got what I asked for. And I just thought, if he'd have said that I must not chew chewing gum, I'd have promised I'll do that. But he said, in American history, and I thought, that's a lot to write. <laughs> and so I'll do the other. But, but getting back to being a little, maybe, maybe a little humor here, when we, we look at certain things in Scripture, think about a period of time. That first period is how I got talking about this was American history. And, and our class schedules, was, every class didn't meet an hour. But if you had, you, you had a schedule, you had, you had the classes that uh, were scheduled for that day. And, and, and so that's a period of time. Well, dispensations are periods of time. There was a period of time, as we see on Larkin's chart, that's a period of innocence. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden lived in a state of innocence. That ended when they sinned. And we're going to look at this in more depth later, but I want you, the, the sheet that I gave you, and if you don't have one, that's why I was mentioning the help with mailing these out, emailing them, or printing some more for next week. In each of these, there's a responsibility of failure judgment. Now, that's the sheet I gave you. You see it also on the Bible map. So you got two sources, a printed source, uh, two printed sources, and, and so I, I want you to, to think about that a bit, and then we are going to move a little well that is not working well we're not we're going to sit here and look at that for a bit let me well i want you to look see don't worry about that ipad because <laughs> this this thing's act i can't even close it i can't don't tell me this thing's locked up let's see if i can close that no nope. well I know people watching the stream won't have a clue what we're doing. 
because I don't. But uh, I want to. I well, I'm gonna have to do it, and I hate to do it unless somebody's more knowledgeable. None of these keys are working. Mm -mm. I was trying to back it up with it. So, I'm going to have to do this. Ah, I want you to know. That isn't good. Let's see if I got a mouse. I got a mouse. Let's go down here. Let's go down here. Let's, let's go down here. And I'll have to, if I could, now's when I should be telling you something funny. <laughs> when we get this all starting back up. But anyway... If you can, if you can picture in your mind the time, and then before the innocence, there was before the foundation of the earth of the world, before the creations as we know it in our world. So that that goes way back then, and then you start with man in the Garden of Eden, and that's going to go through with man until the new heaven, new earth. In between, you have what you have on the Bible map. You have different periods of time. Always, and, and well, I think in every case, counting the church uh, with Christ as the head of the church, always there's a man involved, Adam in the Garden of Eden. Now, well, the conscience side would maybe, maybe not have a personality, but then you got Noah at the flood, you got Abraham at the time of promise, you got Moses with the time of the law, and then you got Jesus, the head of the church, as you get to the church age, and then there's Antichrist during the tribulation, and then you got Christ again in the millennium. Nearly every period of time, as you look in Scripture, you can find a personality that would have been at the front of it. If they, you know, if they didn't, like in Antichrist's case, he, he leads the rebellion. But, uh, well, I want you to look. That brought it back up. Now let's see if it works. Hey, I learned something. I learned something. I don't know how long it'll last, but now I got to go over here and find where that went to. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Everything moves when that projector gets involved. All right, here, I want you to look at this with me. That shouldn't have come up. That's not what I want. <laughs> Prophecy outline. That's a thought. This thing is going crazy. I may have to. Well, we having trouble getting the Mac. This isn't good. There has got to be an invader. I tell you what, we'll have to regroup. Let's see if PowerPoint will work. All right, you see the Bible map? All right, let's do it that way. Okay. All right, so you got something that I can point to. What Everything I wanted to lead to to show you. Uh, it's where this thing is it's getting it's, it's locking up. He's never done that before But let's look at Bible map and anybody watching if you want a map. We'll send them to you um, Glad to do it. This is a map that was done by Leon Bates a dear friend Leon was in Dallas his background is a lot like Larkin. He was an engineer a layman and then he was introduced to during the 70s, the late great planet Earth, Lindsay's book and other studies, he became, he became absorbed with prophecy, but not for the sake of prophecy. His real passion was soul in it. And if you look at the back of that map in front of you, just turn it over and look in the last panel. The plan of salvation is the clearest, especially if you try to share with a family member who's been in church and you're concerned about their salvation or a neighbor, uh, church people really, that, that, that's the most effective for, for a church background person on the back of that map. You see where it says what percent are you depending on for your salvation? 
and you put some numbers by it, are you 100% for Jesus? 50% for Jesus? 70% for Jesus? And uh, you'll you see some questions. you fill it out. Now, if somebody is not trusting Jesus Christ as, uh, 100% to, to, to go to heaven when they die, is there any other way to get there? It's salvation by faith. Faith is believing. So Leon did this map as a tool for soul winning. But because he was so clear in breaking down the scriptures, Larkin did it this way. This is so much simpler than trying to go through Larkin's chart. And so he, he used that. You got, the, you got the innocence, conscience, human government, which I didn't say a while ago. And, and, and really, uh, Nimrod was there at human government because that's where they set up the Tower of Babel. And then following it, you got the call of Abraham, and then you got the law, and then you got the birth of Israel with Abraham. That's that fourth dispensation, grace, church age, Christ. And then you got the little loop at the bottom, that's Antichrist in the tribulation, and then the restoration of the kingdom, and that's Christ reigning on earth a thousand years. Then you got the world being destroyed by fire, and the eternity future where you got the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. So if you, if you look at that map, I, want, I wanted to, to, I didn't take the time, I don't think, last semester, to go through these seven dispensations in a bit of depth. And what I want you to note is, uh, I think this is where you can see it is, uh, breaking down these dispensations to some bite-sized pieces. Because here you have, at the very top, a Bible map, God's plan of the ages. Now, just stop on that thought for a moment. Because early on, and I've used this since Walter's been coming, I guess almost, that's... 20 years or so or more, uh, I, I didn't have it fixed that Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, but you hath he chosen before the foundation of the world, before God made the world, I mean before the innocence over here, the plan of salvation was already fixed. It was already settled. And you see it again in Revelation 13, 8, where the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. That means Christ would be the Passover Lamb. He would be our sacrifice. That all was settled before Adam was ever created, before this period of innocence. Now, why is that important? It's God's plan. Do you see what's at the top of the screen? A Bible map, God's plan of the ages. Now, my church, my church stuff was all about Adam and following. Never gave thought to what happened before Adam. Though it's in the script. You see, you got the hand out on the foundations of the world. You got two pages uh, of scripture on just that phrase before the foundation so and that's not all of them but that's that that gives you some some reference now here's the point if God put a plan in place before he made Adam that upon Adam's sin God did something when he said Adam where are you and Adam then spoke with a voice of fear. He had hidden from God. He said because he was naked. God said, who told you? Have you eaten of the forbidden fruit? And Adam had to say yes. Well, God didn't stop what he was doing and say, well, now we got a problem. I don't think he called up the Holy Spirit and God the Son and said, now we got to talk. Our creation, man, the jewel of our creations in the Garden of Eden has sinned. What are we going to do? He already had the plan. It didn't shock him. He knew. Now that's where some of the Calvinistic teachings come in and they'd want to say 
that Adam was predestined. He wasn't predestined to sin because Adam was a type of the first man. As Jesus became a man in the Garden of Eden, I mean in, in Bethlehem. You see, Jesus was as much a man as Adam or you or I. He had the same temptations. He had the same pain to suffer. He had the same emotional experiences when men rejected him. Because he was, he was all of man, but he was also all of God. And that's what we had to have in a Messiah. And so when you, you see that little, little tract that says, God's simple plan of salvation, it's simple. It's simple. God has already done his part. We do our part by believing in him, John 3, 16. And so when we do prophecy, understand that in virtually every one of these dispensations, whether you see it over here on the Larkin chart or you look at it on the Bible map, for the people who live like Adam and Eve in that dispensation, they experienced the fulfillment of God's word. And don't you want to say thank you, Lord? Because had it not been, we wouldn't be here. Or if we were, we would be here as men without hope. Because the only hope we got is in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not that he lived. It's that he lived, he died, he was buried, third day resurrected, ascended to heaven where he's at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for us. Think about it. I'm sure you've had people in your neighborhood who face some, you know, some, some legal challenges and they, they knew they were going to court and they asked your opinion about something or someone and that someone usually would be a lawyer and they may preface preface the the conversation whether it's a phone call or in person by saying this do you know a good lawyer maybe you've had to ask maybe it was after an accident or something happened or you had a situation like i faced and we didn't have to do it with an insurance company, and then you you know you know they got good lawyers, so then you said, well, do you know a good lawyer? I know a good lawyer. He's my advocate. He's on call twenty four seven. He's at the right hand of God the Father to make intercession for me. Now, when we talk about dispensationalism. And, and, and there's a crowd that frowns on it. I mean, they'd look at, the, the, if they could peep in on our class tonight, they'd say, kind of like, uh, the, uh, it, it's kind of, it's a put down kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of like, what was it, Hillary said something about the, the Trump supporters were deplorables. And, you know, the kind hanging out in Walmart. And how'd she know me? You know, but my point is that there are those that, and, and, and generally, it's higher education that, that does it. Uh, you, you don't meet many just average, everyday uh, people who believe the Bible be the Word of God who forms those opinions. And they kind of look down on those. And if they learn that you don't have degrees, then they feel like that they're superior to you and that literally, you're too dumb to understand the Bible. But if you got smart like me, then you'd believe it the way I believe it. And, and as I've gotten older, especially in ministry, I'm going to be honest with you. I had some buddies, good friends, prayed together, studied together when I was in, in, in Bible college that had a whole lot more potential than I did. A lot more polish. A lot more of the oratorical skills. 
Some of them didn't last three years, two years. Some never got beyond the first church because they went into ministry off of what they had in their head and not what's in the heart. And you can have it in your head and miss heaven and lead others on that route. You can't analyze it. You just got to believe it. And, and that's why, for me at least, my study that involved dispensationalism simplified it. I didn't have to sit down and, you know, dissect everything that with this critical analysis that you do, this higher criticism where you look in the Word of God and they, the theologians will tell you, well, you can't understand that unless you know who wrote it, when they wrote it, to whom they wrote it, why they wrote it, and what you to get out of it. And then that doesn't matter talking about Luther or whoever. They go back to and, and church founders. They want to know all about it. And all I ever wanted to do was know, what does it say? God, what are you telling me? And, and that's where my study of prophecy really began to, to catch fire. And, and, and many, many uh, that, I, that were my peers. They're either retired, out of ministry, and, and a lot of them dropped out on the wayside. And, and so I think the same thing happens with lay people. If you don't understand God's big picture, there's enough trials, tribulations going to come into your life. And whenever you, if you're standing alone, trusting what you know and what you can figure out, and not trusting in Jesus Christ and Him alone, His His the power of His blood. When when you're not there, it's awfully frail. I'm gonna share this. I was debating it a bit, but it, it's classic. I met with Irma uh, and, and her daughter Kim yesterday. Now I don't know how many of you knew John Stackhouse. I knew John here at church. I never really had close fellowship with him. Uh, I would have loved to have now that I'm learning and his whole family was involved in Christian camping for years up in upstate New York and uh, so they were around kids and did things and John John's area was primarily the food production he was involved with the cooking or overseeing all the food to feed the campers well from the time John learned that he had the the liver cancer and it wasn't good. And he'd gone to the, the last doctor, the oncologist, and said, there's nothing we can do. We'll keep you as comfortable as possible. And he goes home and hospice comes in. And so, what a bleak picture. Well, when I went by to see him the first time, I'm all the way there searching my heart, praying, Lord, give me something to help him. Well, the first thing happened when I get in the room, he's making jokes. Well, the other day, this is about two or three days before his death. Uh, Kim and her sister were there in the bedroom with him. <laughs> he, out of the blue, whispers to them with a struggling kind of voice, I understand. Come here. Hold my hand. And then he said, I'm dying. And bing, he did that. They thought he was dead. And then one of them said, Daddy, are you teasing me? And he started laughing. Now, you, you tell me how many other people would do that. If you don't have some things pretty well settled in your heart, you know, usually you're facing those dark moments. It's, there's hardly enough stuff to keep propped up. Well, the reason it came to mind after his death, the hospice nurse comes in, and they're sitting in the den, and the nurse then goes into the room uh, where John's body was, comes back out, and asks the question about, it, it, what, I, I, I'm going to mix this up, but basically, when, when have you seen your daddy? And, and I think the intent was, do you want to see him like a closing time? You know, that sort of thing. Well, whenever the nurse 
ask the question, the daughters got to roll in their eyes. And even Irma said, I know he's dead. I mean, that's the why. I know he's dead. But their thought was he's playing another joke. And so you can find what you need if you ask for it. That's Matthew 7, 7, asking you receive, seeking you, uh, find, knock, it'll be open unto you. But I thought that was so classic. That's one of the, of all the years of hearing people who, who were at the point of death, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody who could make others smile, uh, you know, in light of where, where they were going. But these different time frames, you got to picture this too now. In every dispensation, you got people who lived. And people who died. And it's do you die with hope? Do you not, you know in whom you believe? And that's the plan of salvation that God put in place before he ever made the world. Now if he did it that far back and he did it with that design, my question is in this modern church age where we're seeing a degree of falling away and and I really, I don't even know if there's a falling away. I think we've had a whole lot of people who were in church, didn't have it. We're kind of faking it till they could make it. And then you got this trend. And if they quit church, they're not alone. And, and, and I, don't, I think we have a lot of folks who just drop out on God who've never been in. Because he's the gatekeeper. He, he, he's, the, he's the one that makes it all possible for us. So, the period of innocence, you see next the period of conscience. And then, uh, and you heard, let me comment on this a little bit too. You've heard people say, and, and, and I've had parents who've said this to me about their kids, and they want to say, well, everybody's got to sow their wild oats. I agree. But you've got to reap them too. And then some people say, well, I just teach my kids to let their conscience be their guide. Well, I don't know that I'd advocate that even, even, even encourage it because that's what was going on before the flood. That's a sign of Noah, as we see in Matthew 24. And we're going to do a whole session on the sign of Noah a little bit later. So I, I wouldn't, I, I'd kind of want to run from this idea that, hey, I'm going to let my conscience be my guide for this reason. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says that the heart, the human heart, is, is, is wicked, deceitful, desperately wicked. And, and so can you trust your heart? Well, the only way I know you could kind of do it and have confidence is you got a track record and you'd say, my heart has never lied to me. And some of the big decisions I made that blew up on me were those I made when I just believed with my heart it was the right one. And had it been, uh, it would worked. You know, where he leads, he feeds. Where he guides, he provides. But the devil will get you in a stump hole if you're not careful. And so here we got, we got some basics. And then this next human government, that's a Tower of Babel. That's a failure there. That was the first one world system led by a type of Antichrist, and his name was Nimrod. And there's tons and tons and tons of stuff that comes out of the old Assyrian Empire and some of the writings there. And uh, that, would, that would really take a whole course to do that. And by the way, I didn't say this, but then Scott Campbell, in his, in, his, in his case, I mentioned that he did the creation thing, and he does children's programs, but he also is an apologist. He's a defender of the scriptures. Kind of on the order of uh, Eric Barger. He's polished. He's smooth. He's not red-faced, veins popped out, hollering, screaming his points. He just methodically lays it out. And uh, he talked a, bit, a little bit about that yesterday. So going forward, I'll have help. And he was into the study of Genesis 6 long before I was. And uh, it, it, yeah, he, he's got a mind like a tar bucket. Uh, he hears it, it's, he, 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 it sticks. So when you look at the human government, that was a failure. And I don't care how hard the politicians try 
any human government that's put in place is going to fail and the ultimate failure will be during the tribulation when the one world ruler comes in to set up his kingdom. But then we'd see the tone changes and you got on your map there a green circle starting up. That's the birth of Israel. And it's Abraham. That's promise. And then you'll see that uh, little loop going going down. And this is this is in between the promise and then the law. And what happened with the promise, there was also a failure. And uh, you can see the scriptures that are linking it. Uh, I didn't get my pointer out. But uh, you'll see it on your map. You see the arrow. And then if you look to the right, you see responsibility. That's under promise. You see failure. Here are the verses. Then you see the judgment. And, and you can see that there was the, the captivity. And then we know Moses was the leader who led them. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Led, the, led them out of the captivity. The Egyptian, uh, he scared me. He stuck there. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, I thought Bo was in the room to write it. That's what he does. He, he'll come up and stick his cold nose. On. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I jumped. But you, you can see this period. And then you got Moses with the law. And that failed. And it's, it, it was such a failure that it led to the dispersion of Israel, the scattering to all the nations. Then you begin to see the regathering of Israel. And you've got Bible verses in every one of these. And then you've got what uh, is pictured as the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. That means it closes out the church age. Now, if you are a mid-tribber, that means you're going to move the rapture to the middle of the tribulation. That's after three and a half years. And uh, we know, though, that that's when Satan is going to be cast out. And, 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 and he's going to set up his, his kingdom. And the abomination of desolation is in the middle of the tribulation. We're going to spend more time this semester on um, the tribulation period, but we can't do all of it, but we'll highlight in, the, in this, this abomination, which ties in with Daniel 70 weeks, will we'll, we'll all fit together. And then you see the era, the return of Christ in glory. And this is Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And on this occasion, Christ comes to the earth. That's Armageddon. And, and then you got the responsibility section, the failure sections, and so forth under each of these dispensations. And then at the very bottom, you see some interesting uh, things. He says, resurrection of the saved. That's a future event. Matthew 27. Now, what is that, what's that about? Well, we know following Christ's resurrection that there were an awful lot of people who saw him in Jerusalem who had been dead. And they were resurrected upon his resurrection. And that messes up a lot, of, a lot of people that have never either, they've heard it preached against uh, because there's some people who preach a one resurrection and that's largely the problem is the English language has got words that have multiple meanings. And we, we hear, hear something one way and we get locked into it. This, you know, we think it's got to be the way I heard it. And here you, you can see the examples of it. And you get the references in Matthew, Thessalonians, Revelation. And then also you have, again, a resurrection. Here's Thessalonians 4. This is a rapture passage where those who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet him in the air. But we know the dead in Christ rise first. And so you got activity in the dead first. And then the, the, the living are changed. You see it again in 1 Corinthians 15 as well, beginning in verse 51. And so here you have uh, two separate, and there's some who even add more. And then at the end of the tribulation, you got the Revelation 24 through 6. Can somebody tell me what this resurrection is? What's it known as? The great white throne and they'll come out of the sea 
And that's where they appear before Christ at that final judgment. And only, only the unsaved are at the great white throne of judgment. Huh? I can't hear you. The other one over. Right here, Revelation 20. Oh, 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 okay. Well, in the same chapter. All right, this is 12, 13 verses. This is Revelation 24 through 6. So, uh, but, but you see both in Revelation chapter 20 as to this final, final day. And uh, I would have tagged it, you know, had I, I would have put, uh, well, now this is, well, now this, well, you're right. This is, I'm ahead of myself too. The great white throne is is at the end of the millennium, not the tribulation. So I, I I'm I'm off one dispensation right there. I was running ahead, and then you also have the destruction of, of the earth, new heaven, new earth. You got Second Peter three. Read that and see if you don't see an atomic bomb. And then you got Revelation twenty one one, First Corinthians two nine. But you got passages there, and we know the world as we know it is going to be destroyed by fire. And that's illustrated over here. Now let's comment about that a little bit because I don't think I touched on that in the session so far. <laughs> Some people have difficulty. And I don't really, I've been doing this so long, I can't remember my early emotion about this. But um, I, I think for the most part, the average church uh, a Bible student, church member, doesn't have a clue as to what the future is going to be in, in the context of heaven is going to burn. Earth is going to burn. Everywhere Satan has ever been is going to be purified as by fire. All of it. And, and if, you, if you'll think in those terms, it'll make sense to us. Because there's nothing nor anyone who's going to go into heaven. And I'm saying heaven is our future home, streets of gold, gates of pearl, or the new earth. Because the old one's going to pass away. You sit in Revelation 21, he says it's all going to pass away. And, and behold, all things become new. But... There will not be any, any footprints, fingerprints, where Satan's ever been. It's all going to be made anew. And then, by the way, we become and will be that new creature in Christ Jesus. And we'll have a body like his. And that's going to be akin to another thought, what happens on earth. And we've got to look over here for a moment to see this. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, we confuse sometimes a millennium uh, with the future new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. And, and I, I believe that the new Jerusalem is the home of the bride. I believe the new earth is the home of others. And that could be, I mean, we got only two, two classes of people, three. Uh, there will be no lost people. So you got the saved, the bride, the redeemed. And then you've got the Gentiles and you got the Jews. And our, I guess, identification changes uh, as, a, as a part of the bride. And I think people who have the idea, well, I'm not really worried about this. Whenever I die, I'm going to heaven and heaven's going to be my home and everything be good. And it will be. Heaven's heaven. It will be. But we live there an awfully long time. Would you agree to that? And what we will be in heaven is determined by who we are while we're here on earth. And, and that's why it is so important that we're obedient to that still small voice, to the, to the Lord as he speaks. And then we find our place of service. Because I believe when we do, if we do a few things here, he'll give us more to do there. And then there are those that we see in the talents that because they didn't, didn't do, they lost what they had. And it was given to those who do. So 
you have to, you, we got to focus on the practicality. We spend more time there because we never grow old. It's never a sunset. And that's new to my thinking. The glory of God illuminates heaven. It's his glory. He'll be the sunshine and the moonshine. He'll be, it is no dark. It is no, I mean, everything's transparent. So that's exciting for me, at least. So I want to take time tonight to, to take you on that little journey. And uh, now let me get this out of the way. And then I want to, I'm going to try to go one more place. I'm scared to do the authority because it kept pop, it's popped up right here. I gave a handout, authority and religion. Didn't you get that? that? One of the handouts I gave you? There's multiple pages. Or is that the, is that the date 70 weeks? Maybe that's 70 weeks. It's about four or five, six pages. I'm going to highlight this, and then, and then we'll, we'll come back later. The table of contents. For this study is multiple pages. You can look through here. And it's all on one topic. Authority in religion. And I had to confess. And I have to you. That um, I, I never gave enough, enough thought to it. I, I, didn't, I didn't dwell on it. Um, and John one, And a part of this is, is in the English translations of words as well. Because. The word's the same for power, for authority, for jurisdiction. I mean, for that that, that uh, would be the municipalities where you go up against City Hall. All those powers uh, are, are the same. I, I did this on Sunday morning during Sunday school to a degree. Uh, and, and a lot of what I shared then, and it's, it, it's still uh, based out of this whole picture of, of authority. Why is it relevant? I mentioned maybe Sunday night about Steve Clarity. He, he had his wrong name on his birth certificate. And he got ready to go to Israel and really wasn't in a hurry, but he had to have a passport. He'd applied for one, never came, never came, never came. Finally, I think Lois intervened, found out that uh, they had a problem. And so on short notice, I mean, we're in the car going to Conway to the health department. Fortunately, he, he was born here. And we had to get him the right birth certificate. Because with the wrong birth certificate, you got no authority to be here. I mean, you can't prove who you are. You want trouble. You need a legal document based on the birth certificate. If you hadn't got one, you got trouble. Now, what does that birth certificate say? It identifies who you are. It identifies your parents. Now, if you are a distant relative and that distant relative dies and he's a wealthy person or maybe not so wealthy, but he has stuff and is, he dies and then the probate's going to look fun air. Am I right? So you, you could hear it. You could hear people on the street, so-and-so, they looking for old John's heir. You know anybody kin to him? Well, a shyster could say, yeah, I'm kin to him. And he can run down to probate and say, hey, he's my uncle. And what are they going to say to you? Prove it. How do you prove it? You've got to have a birth record. That birth record is authority. Understand me. It is authority. Now, everywhere you look in the Gospels, when he sent the disciples out to preach or to, the first things he did, he gave them power over demons. Second thing he did was that he told them to heal the sick. So the first thing he did, he got demons out of the way. You think about demons in our day? There's one scaring me in this computer right now because <laughs> he's been mixing stuff up and those of you man, that's the first time I've had these kind of problems but the second thing is to heal well he gave it to his disciples now how big is that well we got him in a special group don't we Peter he's looked upon and Peter was a great man 
And he's, he's observed by the Catholics as being the founder the, uh, of the first church. And we know John wrote the Gospel of John. We know Mark's book. We know Luke wasn't a disciple, but he wrote the book of Luke. But we knew the Apostle Paul. We know, we know he wrote, I believe, 13 books of the Bible. And so I always had him in a special category. I would expect, it didn't surprise me when I read in the second chapter that just Peter and the disciples walking down the street and their shadow hit sick people and they got up and they were healed. Can't explain it, but it didn't shock me. But I'll tell you what did shock me. It shocked me when I began to study close Matthew 10, and you got it in the three or four Gospels, that when he sent his disciples out, all 12, he gave them power over demons, and he gave them power to heal. And they marveled when they came back that even the demons obeyed them. And one of the 12 was Judas, who the Bible identifies as a son of perdition. Now, if you tonight are here and you're a son of the devil, don't tell me you scare me. But I know in the four Gospels that there was one and he had special powers that God gave him. So let's talk about that qualification. How did I get qualified then? If God did that for the disciples, he said in John 14, verse 12, to as many basically as believe on him, to them gave he power. One, no, 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 this is 14, 12. Yeah. But the point there was he can do greater things than I did. That's what he told his disciples. John 14, 12. He said, you can do greater things than I did. Why? Well, if you take one of the disciples out, and he did, Judas, when he committed suicide, you got 11. And then later, the call of Paul makes 12 again, but then you had the elected one that filled Judas's vacancy for a bit that we never heard from once the election took place. Pretty remarkable, isn't it? That God enabled these men to do things that he was doing. What's the difference for us? Well, number one, we have to, we have to know him. We've got to have a birth certificate. We can claim to be a child of God. We can raise our hand every Sunday in invitation time that I know I'm saved. But before we get the power, God says, show me your birth certificate. You're born again. You got a birth certificate. You've become that new creature in Christ Jesus. And, and, and that involves a spiritual thirst. And I think one of the disappointments in our day, and I know things compete for a time, I understand that. And I know with a cell phone and a computer and all other stuff, we're never alone. Uh, I mean, I, I would say probably people do fewer things just totally by themselves uh, because of all the gadgets we've got that can ring or get our attention. But follow me for a moment. The more we hunger and thirst for him, the more of him we have. And when we have little or no appetite, for him and the things of God because as we talked about Sunday Demas hath forsaken me why because he loved the world and whenever we in that competition with the Lord when we come out on the world side and not his side we lose the power I mean we can't walk the walk of the world talk the talk of the world be more at home in the world than we are in God's presence, then we won't have that power that the disciples had. That makes sense?
But I believe it's possible. I believe it's possible. And I believe as, as the world crumbles around us, as we see the fulfillment of Scripture that I know is in Revelation, but I think and believe we're going to see a lot of it before we get there. Like I put that little clip up last week on the East Coast Tsunami. I mean, these things, the Yellowstone eruption and other things could happen. Uh, 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 we're only one major natural disaster away from a period of time it would be described as caveman days. The Chinese or the Russians are weak and fire off a bomb that will kill everything electronic and not blow things up. And, uh, I mean, if we lose the satellites. Your phone ain't going to work. I mean, just lose satellites. You don't have to have something major to blow the world apart. And then we got so many other things out there. So the point is, if there was ever a day that as we look at these seven dispensations that we've talked about today, and then you see where Adam was and Momai, could anybody have had a more intimate relationship with God than did Adam? He walked with him every day in the garden. Every day. Then Adam fell. And so where we are is that we must seek that restoration. We want God to, 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 to fulfill in us that we can have that fellowship. And if you ask me what's the bottom line of studying prophecy, that's it. That's it. The more we know him, the more I believe he'll reveal to us. He says in Amos 3, 7, uh, do I hide anything from the prophets? And we also know that in the case of the destruction of Sodom, God said to the, to, to the angelic host about, do we tell Abraham what's going to happen in Sodom? And then God told Abraham, and that's when Abraham started and said, hey, how many, how many souls? We know he gets down to, 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 the, to ten souls, and they couldn't find ten. I don't know if they could find one. I was almost, that was a part of God sought for man was last Sunday. It was a part I had, and I took it out because I didn't have time to, to really develop it. And that's a message of its own. Lot's wife is a message of its own. That's a sign of Lot's wife. She turned back. Her heart was there back in Sodom. It wasn't, it wasn't following God. And so I do believe that as we go forward, the circumstances of which we have no control, no control, I, I just believe is going to drive people in our direction. And I believe God wants a prepared people to share a prepared gospel to seek and save the lost. And, and, and we've got a ringside seat. For example, if you take all the, the, the community that we live in, and I don't know how many others, there may be dozens, I don't know, but I, I know that it's hard to get a good conversation with people outside of our circle, and that's the prophecy studying people, about a conversation about these things that and they have some understanding because it's not being preached. It's not being taught. People aren't really looking for it. And so since we are, God's going to hold us to a higher standard because he, he, he's entrusted that truth to us for purpose. And that should excite us. I hadn't looked at my one. Oh, we're good. We're good. We're good. Now, th this, I'm going to get you this. Uh, this study, if I can get uh, the two kinds of authority, the top one, You'll see that in, 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 the, in, in the Greek. The, this is the power. This is the authority words in the Greek. And, and uh, it's translated in, in English either as the, uh, oh, my mind is locked up, either as power or authority. But I was a power man for a long, long time, and then I had become authority man. I like that word. I like that authority. Uh, if you've got authority, and, and that's what we must have, over these powers and principalities, that's exciting. We don't have to be the victim. And I do believe this too. Now, let's talk about disease and sickness. I know there are cases in Scripture where, well, Paul talked about delivering one man over the devil uh, to get his soul saved. It might be redeemed. And they don't know what his sickness, he, he could have had cancer, don't know what he had. But I do believe that there's some who are, and, and it does, it's not, it's, it's not a, a negative. 
uh, and maybe I got to do a whole session on this, and I hadn't, but I've been, uh, been plowing slow through it. There's demon possession, and there's demon oppression. A saint can't be demon possessed. But I've discovered in some of my studies a term that I had never thought of before. A believer can be demonized. The devil doesn't own his soul. But the devil's controlling his life. And from such, a man can be set free. And, and, and a, a um, well, he's in heaven now, but a man I had read a lot behind and had a lot of respect for. Um gave testimony before his death uh, and and this was probably something that was hard for him to uh, to confess because he would have been in a camp I would I've been in and out of I mean what to say I'm out of but he, he made he said he got sick and the doctors couldn't put their finger on his sickness and he worsened and then he said, of all things that have happened, he had gotten a phone call. And this man had a reputation, so I won't call his name, but uh, because uh, I don't want to have to explain a lot more stuff. I'll just leave it this way. But anyway, he said he had a phone call from a young Episcopalian pastor. And he thought about it, and, and, the, and, the, and the preacher, he said, um, I, I've got you on my heart, and I want to come pray for you. May I come? And he said, certainly. And so the boy came, young man. And he said he was nervous. And he finally said, no, you just, you know, whatever's on your heart. And so the young man went over, laid his hand on his shoulder, and prayed a prayer. And he said, shortly, or even before he finished praying, he said a sound came out of him that was of the world. And he said, and I don't know how long it lasted, five seconds, 30 seconds, or whatever. He said, when that passed, I was well. And he said, it was hard for me to admit to myself that I had a demon in me. And that was the source of my illness. And God used a young man who only believed this is what God wanted him to do that wasn't of his denomination to come and pray for him. And he said, that's when I realized. Because he would have said, if somebody had explained his condition, he's demon-possessed. And he said, I would not even face the reality that a Christian could have any kind of demon experience. And then he goes on to say, since that date, he realized you got all demons aren't the same and they have personalities and how he was he, he had gotten involved I think with some some people who were demon possessed and uh, had prayed for them they had been had, been, had some experience and then that he said may have been because you see when a demon comes out of somebody that demon's going somewhere and, and, and sometimes if we can entertain angels unawares, we don't know who else we may entertain unawares. And he said, honestly, his guard wasn't up. He never thought about that. It's kind of like the idea of once saved, always saved. We, we think if we're saved that the devil's just going to leave us alone. And uh, then he uses the example of Job. Satan afflicted Job. But God used it for his purpose. So I, you, you got quiet on me just then, didn't you? I just sucked all the air out of here. <laughs> so, I mean, what in the world? My point is that I believe as we move further in time, these kind of testimonies that are surfacing, and this one 
This one you may run into on YouTube when you do, you say, that's where the preacher got it. But whenever we, we see things happening that we can't put a label on, we have, to, we have to consider as we take and look at what is going on here and what are the symptoms of what's going on here. And that, that's whether it's in our home, it's whether it's in the family member, it's wherever it might be, that we cannot rule out the possibility that the source of that activity isn't from heaven. It's from below. Now here's the good news. He hadn't left us powerless. I mean, think about it. He hadn't left us powerless. And, and you know, if I were going to do this kind of heavy lifting, I'd probably want to go find me an old saint that I know walks with God every day. And, and you know, he just personifies when you hear him pray, you you, you, you say, you know, we're just sitting right here with God where this man's praying. And then he may have someone like this young Episcopal priest who just got out of school and didn't know any better than to believe. And he heard, he heard about the man's sickness. He got a burden for him, and that's how I believe it works. And then he probably wrestled with that a day or two and finally said, well, I'm going to call him. And he was probably doing like we do sometimes. You go to, to make a visit with somebody that you're really kind of timid especially if you think they may be a little bit hostile to you and you're hoping they, that they're not at home. And that gives you a chance to run back and get in the car. And so this, this young man calls and, 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 and priest says, come on over, yeah, yeah. You know, when we get desperate enough, we'll listen. I believe the day's coming across our globe and in many parts of the country, it's already there, the world is already there. Oh, by the way, uh, how much time we got? Four, ten minutes. I'm going to close with this. I won't open anything new. I got a phone call on, uh, well, Friday at 3 o'clock. I'm on this faith leaders thing, and it involves uh, phone calls, and I probably, probably got hit this right here, White House calls. Uh, I don't know why. This thing's crazy. Oh, oh, let's see, let's see, this is something different. What day was this? No, this was one that was on August 16th. But these are calls from the White House, and this call had to do with the Department, uh, with the Department of Labor announcement on civil rights and protection, religious organizations. And so the President made a speech yesterday at the, at the UN, and we were told at 3, and that's an odd time, I've never had a, a Friday call at least after lunch. And I think there were 500 preachers that were on this call. And they had sent out a couple of notices of how important it was uh, for us to, to hear. And I'm still waiting on talking points. Uh, but they wanted, here, here was the premise of the call. The president's going to make a speech on religious freedom and persecution. And, and they said, we've got 150 world leaders that are going to be a captive audience. And some of those are from countries where Christians are persecuted. And so we need first for you once, you know, to, to uh, uh, inform your people to, to, if they don't catch it, and I didn't get the time, and I don't think they knew the time he was going, going to deliver the speech at the UN on Friday. And then my weekend was such I didn't get a chance to do anything uh, on, on the emails. But the, here was the premise of the call. Tell your people to watch it on a stream, whether it's on YouTube or what, what other source. And I think there's a, a White House website that you can actually hear the entirety of the speech. And then he made another speech. And he said, we want you as church leaders to tell your people that hear what the president says. Understand why he's saying it. And because the persecution is real. And the challenge to religious freedom is real. Now he's going to do some executive orders. He's already done some. Where uh, he, he shot down this Johnson Amendment or whatever they put in back during civil rights when Lyndon Johnson uh, that would take away 
our, our tax exempt status if we mention politics in the church. And that's kind of where the root of this thing's come in today where churches don't mention politics because one, they were intimidated that they could lose their tax exempt status. He said, that's gone. The president already signed uh, a, a, a executive order canceling that and said, if you are, if a church is censored are brought up and challenged for tax exempt status because they have, have, have made a statement that would be considered to be political, let us know. Because we've got a legal defense for it. And he said, they're saying this, that we've got good judges in place, but not all of them. And the battles he has been losing, it's winning some now because he's had some change with judges he's gotten, gotten through uh, on that appellate court level where they've been overruling what local judges have ruled on, especially in the matter of the border and, and these sort of things. But he said, please tell the people to hear what I'm saying and to understand there's a course of action. And don't be confused by the talking points from the major media. And that if all people get from my speech, basically it's what he's saying, is what is told you on certain networks, you've been told a lie. And, and, and I thought, wow. So we see things that are encouraging. And, and, and to know we've got in high places at least one advocate. But I want... I, 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 if we don't if we don't appreciate what what God has done for us as a nation and the opportunity he's put in front of us if we lose in this in this current four or five years because most of us are old enough that we're not going to be in the picture and this 47 percent that's pro-socialism that they're polling, that if, if, if the country becomes socialistic, it'll be probably the last election because they'll control the conversation. And the way they're, they are controlling, have controlled, and will control is through the courts. And that's our system. See, we got to abide by the law. And so we we got a lot to pray over. We got a lot to be excited about. It. And so I just happened to see that that uh, had that notice there. Now again, I've said it several. I don't know how I got on this list, but uh, they had sent several emails and asked for input. And and especially would have been if we were facing stuff here, then they wanted to know it. And I felt around, and I don't I don't know of anything here with our elected representatives, especially we go to Washington, those of you who went to CUFI, you know that all but maybe one or two uh, who are serving in the House, uh, they, they uh, are solidly in support of the President. And uh, of course, Lindsey Graham leads the pack with a speech he made, especially for Israel. And uh, he, he is one of the uh, stronger voices right now in this effort to drain the swamp. And I think the swamp will be if, if it's the courts. But that's what's been slowing things down, is within the courts. But uh, I believe that there's, I, I saw a headline today and didn't get to read it. Uh, I think that it's not gonna be long before some, some uh, indictments are gonna be coming forth. And uh, it's amazing, <laughs> it's just amazing what uh, certain networks, I think Brother Paul was mentioning, this last deal with the whistleblower. I mean, it, it's verbatim what they did to Kavanaugh and what they've done previously to the president. And it's coming from the same sources, printing the same media, and all of it's hearsay. And see, so this thing first came out. I, I, did, I thought the, hears, uh, the, the whistleblower was in the room, heard the conversation. It didn't. It was secondhand, and probably what we were, what we broke in the news was what the reporter wrote. And, and, and so, if we're not in trouble, listen, people, we, we gotta have God. I mean, that's just the bottom line. We did, 
Huh? He knows well, sure he does. <laughs> Mature does. I mean, I mean, this whole thing with 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 these with Kavanaugh and all these accusations made. In fact, the woman that they accused of the last round didn't even remember it. I mean, she's finding her name in something that, in this book that was written, and she didn't even remember the incident. But yet, the, if you read the press, you would never know that they, and you got these young people who believe it. I mean, they believe it. They foam at the mouth believing it. And so if you're constantly fed these fabrications and don't know any better, and most people are, so, so, you know, so, they, they, they want to avoid it. They don't want to know. And, 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 and uh, I'm in the opposite camp. If I'm going to form an opinion on something, I would at least want to know how to pray about it. And if you don't know the truth, you don't know how to pray about it. But, um, well, we are going to close. Any questions? Let's do, we got a good question, Walter. Yeah. That's the one I'm referring to. I did not get to see all of it. But, oh yeah, that's what he, that's what the phone call I got Friday was about, was his speech. Yep. Yep. He, uh, yes, brother, please. That's a fabrication. No, it's inquiry. They're changing the words, but it's inquiry. When I first saw it, I thought, you know, they, they, they'd been threatening this and threatening. But uh, it's, a, it's a play on words to feed that crowd that, that's, you know, so, so fanatical about this. And she's appeasing it. But the thing is, see, they don't know any better. See, they think she's finally agreed to do this. And all it is is open the inquiry. And, and that's what they've been doing since the since before the election was having an inquiry. That's not new. Oh, yeah. Oh, he is a special work. Any other questions? We got another minute or so. A word about Sunday. Pray for our men. And, uh, you know, if Satan could sabotage a service, he'll do his best to do it Sunday. Because we get to hear from our people. And we want to pray that, that they will... will this the Holy Spirit's anointing will be on us, and, and, and the words and so forth will be there, and, and it's exciting to, for me to be a witness to it, to see what, uh, what, what has happened. And also pray for Scott Campbell. Pray that, uh, that this transition is 99.9% .9 affirmed, and, but there's still, you know, you, know you, could, you could hit a hurdle somewhere. But uh, I, I want to say this as far as... Uh, he is probably one of the most gifted, and it kind of makes me, it's one thing to have somebody who can preach and sing, but somebody who can do it all. I mean, it's, he's not a musician, but my, his, his creative, for those who you were here back in the summer, he did the video, he did a PowerPoint on his last trip into Kokstan or wherever he was at. He did this camp. Well, he couldn't take his, he, he, did, he did this, this um, J Jurassic Park theme and so he couldn't take his props that he would take like the dinosaurs so when he got there he had a source on getting styrofoam and just foam rubber the man made these 15 foot whatever size dinosaurs cut them out of, of, of styrofoam and and other crafts painted them and looking at them it looked like a real dinosaur. And whenever he showed us this past summer, I said, wow. This, if he, he gets an idea, he's creative. And then th there's some things that, that he's going to bring uh, to us and, and opportunities. It, it's not going to be like, you know, once and done. And I want to I say this because it's been discussed a lot. If doing church would reach our community, through this church, O'Ree County would have been converted 20 years ago because we have a doing church. So doing church won't do it. But that that the people are unprepared for will. 
And he has been doing, I, I hate to tell you this, we live. Okay, well, let's thank you for watching. I'm going to stir some curiosity. You close us off.